Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Gilbert Hosts. Today, we're going to be discussing dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system in people with Parkinson's. Now, what is the autonomic nervous system? That includes the nerves that lo are located throughout the body that control automatic body functions. And we'll talk a lot about what that exactly means. Now, due to dysfunction of this nervous system, many people with Parkinson's experience difficulty with blood pressure, and that can lead to dizziness and fainting. Uh, autonomic dysfunction commonly leads also to constipation in Parkinson's, urinary dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, poor temper temperature control, and sweating abnormalities. So there's a lot of difficult problems that people with Parkinson's face because of autonomic dysfunction. So I'm going to start with a brief overview of autonomic dysfunction, and I'm going to focus primarily on blood pressure dysregulation. And then after that, my guest, Dr. Jose Alberto Palma, who's an expert, will join me and will be answering a lot of questions about this very, very difficult topic. So let me begin. So autonomic dysfunction in Parkinson's. So as I already mentioned, this is the problems that result when there is dysfunction in areas of the body that we don't normally consciously control. So for example, in the gastrointestinal tract, we don't tell the stomach, release food into the small intestine, release medicine into the small intestine. That happens automatically by a series of nerves that line the gut. Similarly, in our urination, we do not tell the bladder when to give us the signal that it's time to urinate because the bladder is a certain amount full. That happens automatically because of nerves that line the bladder. Blood pressure as well. We don't tell our blood vessels to get smaller or larger to control blood pressure. That happens due to nerves that we barely knew were there before we developed Parkinson's. And temperature regulation similarly, controlled by nerves that are part of the autonomic nervous system. So why are these functions affected by, uh, by Parkinson's disease? And that is, um, that is a very good question. So we, we need to take a step back and realize that historically, Parkinson's disease was always considered a movement disorder, as you know. And that is because of the pathology of Parkinson's affecting an area in the brain called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is located in an area of the brain called the midbrain, and it controls motor function. And when there is Parkinson's pathology in the substantia nigra, and there is cell loss in this area, you get the hallmark motor features of Parkinson's, including tremor, slowness, stiffness, walking problems, etc. But the, pro the problem is that Parkinson's pathology does not stop there. There's actually Parkinson's pathology in many other locations in the brain including brainstem nuclei or other areas in deep in the brain that control automatic function. So for example, gut function is controlled in an area of the brain called the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. When that area of the brain has Parkinson's pathology, gut function can be affected. But in addition, the nerves that actually line the gut can contain Parkinson's pathology can contain abnormal accumulation of alpha-synuclein, which is the hallmark of Parkinson's pathology in the brain and elsewhere. And so a combination of a prob problems in the brain and in the nerves that actually integrate with our gut and with our, our urinary system, et cetera, cause these problems in Parkinson's. Similarly, in temperature regulation, the part of the brain that controls temperature called the hypothalamus can have Parkinson's pathology as well as the nerves that innervate sweat glands and blood vessels that directly control temperature as well. Blood pressure, similarly, the nerves that innervate the heart and the blood vessels can be affected by the same pathology as Parkinson's disease and all these other symptoms. And uh, finally, urinary function as well. So in the past, Dr. Gilbert Hose have focused on subsections of autonomic dysfunction. We have had an episode dedicated to gastrointestinal dysfunction. We've had an episode recently dedicated to urinary dysfunction as well as sexual dysfunction. And I welcome you to view these broadcasts on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash APDA Parkinson, where there is a full episode on each of these topics. What we have not yet focused on is blood pressure regulation. And so we're gonna spend a little more time on this episode focusing on that 
However, our guest is very equipped to answer questions on autonomic dysfunction in general, and so we will open up questions to uh, topics that are more varied than blood pressure. So now let's talk about neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. This is the scientific way of saying poor blood pressure regulation. So what exactly is going on in this condition? So the definition of this uh, problem, this dys dysregulation of blood pressure, is when blood pressure drops more than 20 millimeters of mercury for the top number of the blood pressure or 10 millimeters of mercury for the bottom number of the blood pressure when changing head position, when going from lying down to sitting to standing. Now, why does this happen? Because normally the act of standing up triggers release of a chemical in the brain called norepinephrine. And the norepinephrine interacts with the nerves that innervate the blood vessels and causes them to get smaller, to narrow. When the blood vessels narrow, that allows the blood pressure to be maintained. When there is dysfunction of the nerves that release the norepinephrine because of Parkinson's pathology, then changing head position does not trigger that response and blood pressure falls because the, the blood vessels are not constricting and keeping that blood pressure high or intact. Now, what are symptoms of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension? And this could be something that people watching may be very familiar with, lightheadedness, blurry vision, feeling faint, and frankly, frank passing out, feeling so dizzy, you know, I need to hold on, I'm feeling very dizzy, and then passing out. That could be very dangerous because there can be injury from the falls. Some less obvious symptoms that some people may experience include fatigue, cognitive fluctuations, shortness of breath, and neck and shoulder discomfort. So what do you do about neurogenic orthostatic hypotensions? What treatments are available? So the first thing we focus on are lifestyle modifications. So we, we want to uh, help people control their environment and the things that they put into their body that can modulate blood pressure in the absence of this normal regulatory system that is impaired in certain people in Parkinson's. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that any medications that you're taking that lower blood pressure are, are modified, let's say, because people who have Parkinson's may have had a diagnosis of high blood pressure before their Parkinson's diagnosis, and they're on medications to lower their blood pressure. And so in the setting of the development of orthostatic hypotension, these medications may need to be adjusted. In addition, Parkinson's medicines themselves can cause orthostatic hypotension. And so there might be a push and pull, giving enough Parkinson medication to control motor symptoms, but not too much that lower blood pressure. So that's a discussion needs to be had with your doctor. Caffeine, alcohol, and sugary drinks are not good uh, interactions with, with blood pressure if you wanna maintain blood pressure. You do wanna increase other fluids, however, um, water and fluids that have salts in them. So fluids that may um, be like electrolyte drinks may be a good addition to the diet. And increasing salt in the diet, sometimes with salt tabs or with salty foods can be a very helpful addition to raise blood pressure in the right setting making sure you get regular exercise. Sometimes that would need to be performed in the seated position, but can be very helpful to maintain blood pressure. Another problem that people may have is something called postprandial hypotension, which is um, a low blood pressure that occurs after a big meal. And so to avoid this, these two problems together, low blood pressure after a big meal and orthostatic hypotension, um, not having large carbohydrate filled meals can help with that problem. Another really big one is changing head position gradually. Never go from lying to sitting to standing. Suddenly, you wanna make all those transitions slowly, giving your body a chance to calibrate as slower if that is what is needed uh, in your situation. So that's a really, really important one. And finally, using compression stockings or an abdominal binder can keep the blood pressure higher. Sometimes all these lifestyle modifications are not enough and you need medication. And so here is a schematic of the uh, nerves that innervate the blood vessel. And I will point out, this is a review written by our guest, Dr. Palma um, and his colleague, Dr. Kaufman. And here you see um, blood, uh, uh, nerve number one, which is uh, the uh, preganglionic sympathetic neuron, talking to nerve number two, the sympathetic nerve, 
and uh, who then, which then talks to the blood vessel. And these two nerves and their interactions with each other and their interaction with the blood vessel can be manipulated with different medications. Um, and so on the next slide, I have a list of the different medications that are prescribed in this situation. We have fludrocortisone, which actually acts not on any of these nerves or blood vessels, but expands the volume of blood, which can maintain blood pressure. Droxidopa is a medication which is a norepinephrine precursor, and that can cause blood vessels to get smaller, thereby maintaining blood pressure. Mitogen, again, acts to what's called vasoconstrict or make the blood vessels narrower and maintain blood pressure. And finally, pritostigmine can increase uh, another chemical called acetylcholine, which again can induce the blood vessel caliber getting smaller, thereby maintaining blood pressure. I'll also talk really briefly about temperature regulation. Uh, temperature regulation is another automatic function that can be affected pretty significantly in Parkinson's for some people. And people with Parkinson's can experience both cold intolerance and heat intolerance. Cold intolerance usually being due to an overconstriction, actually too narrow blood vessel, but in a different place in the hands and the feet. And there isn't enough um, perfusion, there isn't enough blood flow in those areas, and it can cause kind of an annoying um, sensation of having very cold hands and feet all the time. Um, similarly, Parkinson's disease, uh, people with Parkinson's can experience inability to control how hot they are, being be too hot or have excessive sweating um, in a very uh, difficult manner. Now, unfortunately, in terms of treatment of these two uh, problems, um, we don't have a lot of great medications, and we really are relying on some lifestyle modifications to help with um, our poor temperature regulation. So in terms of cold intolerance, we ask people to dress in layers, they may need to wear gloves, use hand warmers, multiple pairs of socks etc. that can be um, helpful in that situation. And in terms of too hot and over sweating, um, using moisture wicking clothing can be very helpful. Avoiding sweat triggers, which include spicy foods, caffeine, and alcohol. Wearing light, airy clothing and drinking a lot of water. And there are some um, helpful uh, tips as well. You can consider a prescription strength antiperspirant, which you can get from your doctor. And there is a gel called glycopyrrolate. This comes in a pill, but also comes in a gel and can be used on areas where there is excessive sweating. And finally, botulinum toxin injections can be used on the hairline, the palms, and the underarms to help with excessive sweating. And so there is, that's a brief overview of some of the autonomic dysfunction um, problems that uh, people with Parkinson's very, very frequently encounter. And uh, there's much more to, to be said, and we're going to open very, very soon, open up our discussion to uh, questions. And to help me do that, I want to introduce my guest uh, today, and who is Dr. Jose Alberto Palma. Now, Dr. Palma is a research professor in the Department of Neurology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York City. He earned both his MD and his PhD from the University of Navarra in Spain. And Dr. Palma's research focuses on the autonomic nervous system in neurodegenerative conditions. He's one of the international coordinators of the natural history study of synucleinopathies, and he's the principal investigator or co-investigator in many clinical trials for treatments of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension in both Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. He also is the principal or co-investigator in trials for the development of biomarkers of disease diagnosis and progression. So welcome Dr. Palma to our broadcast today. Rebecca, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was looking forward to this invitation, right? I, I was I was asking to myself, when is Rebecca inviting me to her series, <laughs> right? So. Let's kick it off. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Amazing. Um, so I'm going to uh, look at some of the questions that um, have come in already. And here is a good one that uh, I kind of knew would be asked right off the bat. So we all know that, blood, that Parkinson's disease can affect blood pressure. But what are its effects on heart, on the heart itself, on heart rhythm, etc.? That's a little harder to kind of pin down. 
want to tackle tackle that one? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and we get that and ask a lot by by our patients, right? So, two ideas. Number one is the effects of, of the Parkinson's may have in blood pressure in some patients is not because the autonomic dysfunction in the heart, right? It's mostly because of the autonomic dysfunction in the autonomic nerves that innervate the blood vessels, right? So the fact that the blood pressure may drop when patients stand up is not mostly due to problems in the innervation of the heart, right? So that's one point. The other point is that the innervation of the heart is also impaired in patients with Parkinson's disease, right? And this is something that we can see in a test called MIBG, which is not frequently done in the U.S. for a number of reasons, right? But other countries like Japan and in Europe, they have this test and they can see how, how preserved the nerves innervating the heart are. And in Parkinson's disease, it's very frequent that almost every patient has some degree of impaired innervation in the heart. Now, to answer the question, what are the symptoms or what are the consequences of that? Well, the good news is that it doesn't cause a lot of symptoms in daily life, in the daily life, right? In regular life of, of the patients, right? So it's not that patients with Parkinson's have more arrhythmias. We don't see that, right? Even though you see some papers saying yes, other papers say no, but the, there is not a lot of solid evidence pointing towards uh, in an increased risk of arrhythmias, right? What we do see is something called chronotropic insufficiency, which means that the maximum heart rate that the heart can achieve when patients exercise is lower, right? Again, this is not, this is not causing a lot of symptoms, a lot of problems, but what some patients may experience is some degree of exercise intolerance, right? So it means that hey, doc, I used to run marathons uh, with not a lot of problems, and now I barely can run a 5K or a 10K, right? Obviously, the motor problems of Parkinson's may be contributing to that, but there is some degree of exercise intolerance, right? Uh, what, we can, what we always tell patients is, please, if you can, do keep exercising, right? Keep moving keep being active because that will help, right? With your heart, with your muscles and with your blood pressure regulation, right? I'll pause there, uh, Rebecca, any follow-up question or any comment on that? Fantastic. So, uh, you know, I guess the bottom line is that the heart is not as affected um, as some of the other um, uh, practically, meaning it is it is affected when you look right. um, with with tests. But in terms of day to day life, effects in the heart are are, are not as um, clinically significant as some of the other um, changes in the auto autonomic nervous system. So that's that's very interesting. So thank you for that. Although there are there are some effects, as you mentioned, with the exercise exactly. intolerance. Yeah. Um, so another another question that we have, which I knew would be asked, um, and I didn't really address it in the introduction because I know it's on a lot of people's minds and we'd ask it here. Um, and this is a question from Lori Alpert, which is, what happens when you have both high blood pressure and low blood pressure? So how do you control the high blood pressure without making the lows too low? That's how right. do you balance that? Very That's difficult. Right. That's a great question. And you know, it's... Uh... It's very frequent that patients with orthostatic hypotension, which means low blood pressure when patients stand up, as Rebecca mentioned before in her introduction, they also have the, the opposite problem when they are flat or sitting, right? So this means that patients have high blood pressure when they are flat or sitting, and then when they stand up, the blood pressure drops. So they have both low blood pressure when they stand up and high blood pressure when they are lying down. And obviously, this is a problem because it makes managing both the high blood pressures and low blood pressures very challenging because whatever we do to fix one, it's going to worsen the other one, right? So if we give medications to increase the blood pressure, that may worsen the high blood pressure problem and vice versa. So I guess this leads us to what is the goal when, when treating blood pressure in patients, right? Uh, well, you see, when, when we see a patient with blood pressure problems in the clinic, a patient with Parkinson's or with multiple system atrophy, the goal is not to normalize their blood pressure, right? Because that's 
going to be very difficult, right? It's going to be almost impossible to get a perfectly normal range in their blood pressure. The goal is to make sure, number one, they don't faint when they stand up or that they don't have severe symptoms when they stand up as to cause a lot of problems in their lives. And at the same time, we have to ensure that the blood pressure is not too high so that in the long term, they don't have any problems with, let's say, strokes or, or similar complications that are often associated with high blood pressure in the general population, right? So it's a matter of finding the balance. And for these, we have to listen to, to the patient and understand what are the patient's needs, right? So for instance, sometimes we have patients who only have symptoms of low blood pressure in the morning when they, stand, when they first wake up and get up and they have a shower and they have breakfast. And then the rest of the day, they, they do okay, right? So and once we confirm that those symptoms of, of dizziness in the morning are, low to low, are, are due to low blood pressure, we can give the patient a short-acting drug, like the ones Rebecca mentioned, right? Like mitodrine or droxidopa. And when you give only one dose of those drugs, they last for about three hours in the system, right? So they are relatively short-acting, which is good for these patients who have symptoms in very specific circumstances. And the fact that these are short-acting medications, they can prevent high blood pressure when the patient is flat, right? Uh, that's one strategy. There are many other strategies, right? Rebecca also mentioned that patients in general should avoid the flat position completely. And this is because, again, we want to avoid very high blood pressures when the patient is flat. And to this end, what we recommend is that patients sleep with the head of the bed raised at night with the help of pillows or, or a wedge, a triangle-shaped wedge of some material, right? or an electric bed. Uh, so there are many strategies that can help us increase the blood pressure when needed and reduce the blood pressure when needed. What we need to avoid though is when patients are taking both medications to increase the blood pressure and decrease the blood pressure at the same time. That doesn't make any sense, right? And very often we see patients taking that type of combinations, right? Because they have both problems and sometimes their local physicians are not too familiar and they are confused. Well, if you have high blood pressure, take this medication to lower it, but because you have low blood pressure, you need to take this other one. Well, it's not a matter of taking both at the same time. It's a matter of selecting which strategy each patient needs, how long each medication lasts in the system, and the more we can use non-pharmacologic measurements, the more we can use non-drug strategies, the better, right? Sometimes I talk too much, Rebecca. So you just, No, that you just was fantastic. Me, right? I'm learning so much because that is definitely a common problem. And that was a great uh, synopsis of, uh, of right. the problem. Here's another really common thing that I hear from people, um, which is, is there, from Lakely, is there a cause of dizziness that happens when blood pressure is normal? So... What I think uh, uh, David Blakely's getting at is that, um, you know, if he, if he uh, um, complains of dizziness to his physician, automatically it'd be, oh, it's your blood pressure. But that isn't what he's finding. He, he's dizzy and doesn't have problems with blood pressure. So what do you do in that situation? What else could it be? Great question, David. Very common, very common to, that we see patients uh, in that predicament, right? They, they have dizziness, their general practitioner thinks, oh, dizziness means blood pressure problem or dysautonomia, just go see the dysautonomia experts, right? And then when we get to measure blood pressure, it doesn't drop when the patient is standing up, right? So look, in that case, you have to, the doctor has to be very methodical and go over other potential causes of dizziness, right? Because remember that dizziness it's a relatively non-specific term, right? Dizziness means what? That you are, things are spinning around your head or you feel woozy, like inebriated, or you feel about to faint, or you feel unstable, or you're just tired or sleep deprived. So dizziness in each patient can mean different things, right? So that's one, the first step, right? Trying to understand what is the exact 
feeling that the patient is experiencing at that time, right? And then, as I mentioned before, there are a long list of potential causes for dizziness, right? A lot of medications cause nonspecific dizziness, right? So that's one thing to look at. Some problems in the inner ear ca can cause vertigo-like dizziness, right? So things spinning around. Some patients with Parkinson's occasionally have something called orthostatic tremor, which is a very tiny, almost like invisible tremor in their legs that can be detected with some diagnostic test, but you cannot see it, right? But it, it's making the patient feel a little unsteady and so on and so forth. Look, sometimes we cannot even detect the cause of that dizziness, right? And we describe that, I published with my team a paper that we called the inebriation-like syndrome in Parkinson's disease, right? And these were patients that will come to our clinic describing this feeling of inebriation when they, first thing in the morning usually, right? And they were walking around like feeling inebriated. We did every single test under the face of the earth, right? We even measure blood flow in their brain. We measure uh, to see if we could diagnose orthostatic tremor. We measure CO2 in their blood, right? So we measure everything. We couldn't find the cause, right? So sometimes in a minority of patients, they might feel dizzy and we still don't know why, right? But in most patients, we can identify the cause. And many times it has nothing to do with blood pressure. Very good. Okay, that's yep. very, very helpful. All right, lots of questions coming in. We have a question <laughs> from Paul French, which is, if this is a great question, if your blood pressure is extremely low, but you don't have symptoms, yep. what do you do? <clears throat> so in the great... 70s, let's say, blood pressure yeah, no, that's a good. That's a great question. So look, if on the other hand, that's good news for you, right? It means that your brain somehow is able to work with such low blood pressures without any, with too much of a problem, right? There is another issue though. Uh, and this was described by uh, some colleagues of, of mine in Harvard, right? They did some tilt table testing in patients with Parkinson's. And in some patients, they were having very low blood pressures and they were not saying anything about symptoms, right? And then they measure cognitive function in those patients. And those patients that were unable to identify symptoms had some degree of cognitive dysfunction, right? Meaning in some patients, it might well that maybe because of their initial mild cognitive issues, they have some trouble maybe identifying their symptoms or maybe communicating their symptoms, right? So that's something to, to take into consideration, right? That maybe some patients with very low blood pressure, they might not say anything, but that's a problematic blood pressure, right? So anyhow, in the first case that I mentioned, it's a patient with no cognitive issues, but still have low pressure, has low blood pressure. What we will do is we will identify the problem. Obviously, we will explain that problem to the patient. And perhaps we will start with non-pharmacological measures, right? We will tell the patient, look, your blood pressure is very low. It's great that you don't have symptoms, but be aware of that and be mindful that if you eat a lot of sugary drinks or carbohydrates, your blood pressure may drop further and you may feel symptoms, or maybe you should drink more water or so on and so forth, right? So we will encourage non-pharmacological measures. Okay. In the other type of patient and the ones who may have some cognitive dysfunction, maybe it's not a bad idea to start with a very low dose of some of the short acting drugs that we were talking before and take it from there. In any case, in both patients, I will I will recommend a very close follow up because in at any moment that a symptomatic blood pressure of seventy may drop to sixty five and cause symptoms, right? So it, there is a very thin line between having symptoms and not having symptoms. Got it. So just to clarify, um, so you're suggesting that um, somebody may have low blood pressure and think it's asymptomatic, but cognition could be a symptom, which they're not appreciating. 
That's correct. So particularly if, if the patient is in an age group or in a comorbidity group that we suspect that there might be cognitive issues, right, in patients with Parkinson's, that's something that we should we should have on the radar, right? That, hey, yes, the blood pressure is very low. The patient is not telling us anything, but maybe the patient is experiencing something that maybe they don't know how to properly express, right? That could be one possibility, right? But yeah, absolutely. Very That's good. a different story from a young patient yeah. in whom we, we would not expect cognitive issues, in whom the blood pressure drops, but still has no symptoms, right? That probably means that the brain is working beautifully to, to regulate blood pressure, right? Got it. Very good. All yeah. right. Great question from Kelsey. And I do apologize to everyone asking questions. Each question is better than the next. Um, we will get to as many as we can. Um, so here is uh, Kelsey's question. So high intensity training has been shown to be helpful for people with Parkinson's and in, in general, it's it's yep. sort of a really uh, fast growing trend in the exercise world. But what happens when you get dizzy or even faint when you have that intense exercise? Is there what what how can you have both? If, if at all possible. That's right. Kelsey, that's a great question. I have good news and bad news, right? The bad news is that patients with Parkinson's and orthostatic hypotension, meaning patients with Parkinson's and blood pressure issues, usually the, the exercise will lower the blood pressure further, right? So that's the bad news, right? So people with blood pressure problems, patients with Parkinson's with blood pressure problems, usually when they exercise they will get dizzier, right? Like you were describing in your question. What's the good, the good news? The good news is that you can, they can still exercise. However, it's better to avoid the standing up position because that's a position where the blood pressure is most likely to fall, right? So what we usually recommend is exercising in the sitting position, right? It can be with a recumbent bicycle or with a rowing machine or any other type of exercise that does not involve being standing up or running on a treadmill, right? We running on a treadmill in a patient with low blood pressure, I will disencourage that, right? I will advise against that. The other great exercise that most patients love is any exercise in a swimming pool, right? Why is that? It's because the when you are inside the water with the head out so that you can breathe, right? The, 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 the pressure of the water around your body is like a huge stocking and it's going to maintain your blood pressure relatively stable. It may drop a little bit, but not as much as it would drop with the patient outside of the water, right? So you can do a lot of exercise, usually with no symptoms or very mild symptoms when you are inside the water, right? So that's something that we do recommend a lot. You have to be careful when you get out of the water, right? When you get out of the swimming pool, because that the, the protective effect of the water goes away, and that's when you may start feeling symptoms, right? But inside the water, no problem. Sitting, recumbent bicycle, rowing machine, all those are great exercises as well. So please don't stop exercising. Exercise, you must continue exercising, but please uh, do so in a in a prudent in a in appropriate way right fantastic advice thank you yeah. those are great tips all right so here's a question that i knew we would get to um and uh i know you're gonna have a, a great answer for this one too so if somebody has neurogenic orthostatic hypotension does that suggest multiple system atrophy or could it still be regular parkinson's and this is a question yeah. from carol perfect so most patients with MSA have neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. And so that has prompted a lot of physicians to automatically have these, uh, this connection, right? Oh, this is a patient with Parkinsonism and the patient also has neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. Therefore, this is MSA. Well, the answer is not, not necessarily, right? So we have, again, 80%, 75, 80% of MSA patients have NOH, but we also know that NOH is present in around 25, 30% of patients with Parkinson's, right? So a, a substantial number of patients with Parkinson's have NOH, right? It doesn't mean it's symptomatic in every patient, right? When you look at the symptoms, 
the percentage goes down to around 15%, right? So it's a, it's not a lot of patients with Parkinson's, but still a substantial number so that we still need to do further investigations to figure out if the patient has Parkinson's or MSA, right? So uh, bottom line, if you have NOH, it does not necessarily mean that you have MSA, right? You may have Parkinson's and NOH as well. Very good, thank you. Yep. Um, so there are a number of questions about medications and how medications can uh, feed into this problem, worsen the yep. problem. So uh, David Gooch asked the question, can fluctuations in dopamine medication absorption um, contribute to this problem? Um, presumably, um, uh, David has problems um, that not every dose of medication is the same. Some are absorbed better, some are not. How does that feed into this uh, problem of um, blood pressure dysregulation? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, and, you know, David, we know that, that levodopa and uh, dopaminergic agonists cause drops in blood pressure, right? So uh, in some patients, it's a, it's a significant problem. In some other patients, it's not that a big of, of a deal, right? So in some patients, it is a problem. Now, if you tell me you're having problems in absorption, obviously that's gonna make the, the absorption of the drug a little more irregular, which in turn may, may make the drops in blood pressure more unpredictable, right? So obviously that's gonna, that's gonna cause um, more unpredictable problems related to blood pressure, right? Uh, look, some of the strategies that we, we usually recommend to patients to sort of minimize or, or reduce the risk for blood pressure problems is when they are starting their any new medication, you do that very progressively, right? And sometimes we even recommend ridiculously slow schedules uh, when, when starting uh, either levodopa, carbidopa, or a dopaminergic agonist, right? And that is to see how the patient is reacting, if there is a drop in blood pressure. And then based on that, you can decide what to do, right? You could decide to stop there or maybe to add some non-pharmacological measures to prevent drops in blood pressure. Or, you know, in some cases, you could even think of starting some short-acting medications like the ones I mentioned before, right? But again, definitely problems in absorption, it's gonna make the the, the blood levels of, of levodopa or dopaminergic agonists more erratic, which in turn, it, may make the blood pressure problem more unpredictable. Very good. So yeah. a number of people um, have been asking, if we could take a step back to our conversation about the heart earlier, um, you mentioned uh, poor exercise tolerance. Um, so a number of people have been asking about uh, low heart rates. Um, so uh, Rachel Parker uh, specifically asks her, her husband's heart rate is between 44 and 50. Um, without any uh, cardiology workup. And other people have asked, you know, what, what exactly happens when you have exercise intolerance? Um, so maybe if you could address that low heart rate situation, how tied is it to Parkinson's? Is there another cause? Um, is this uh, a Parkinson's dis dysregulation problem? Sure, exactly. Well, that's something that we see, right? And it's not only, as I mentioned before, there is this exercise intolerance, but this, it's a relatively lower, heart rate at baseline. And again, when we exercise, the heart rate should go up, right? So in patients with Parkinson's, it does go up, but not as much as it should, right? So maybe when we exercise usually in a treadmill, our heart rate should go to 140, 160, 170, right? In patients with Parkinson's, it may not go higher than X, right? Whatever in each patient, right? And this is something that, that we have studied, right? Meaning we've done exercise tests with treadmills in, in patients with Parkinson's and, and this is well documented, right? So that's correct. I mean, meaning, don't, don't be surprised if you see that your heart rate is lower than usual. Uh, usually th this can scare physicians and, and, and cardiologists, right? Because they think there is an underlying serious problem in the hearts, a serious arrhythmia. And as I mentioned before, is it's it's not a serious arrhythmia. It's not life threatening. This is not going to kill patients with Parkinson's. On the other hand, it's something that that it's good to know about so that everyone is reassured. Hey, because of the autonomic nerve damage that patients with Parkinson's have, there is some degree of 
slowing in the heart rate. And this is much more visible when the patient is exercising, right? So the heart rate doesn't increase as much as it should. And again, in turn, this can cause some symptoms of exercise intolerance, right? But yeah, bottom line, the answer is yes. Lower heart rates are seen in patients with Parkinson's, right? Great, thank you. Yep. Um, so we mentioned uh, both you and I both mentioned about sugary drinks, and uh, you know that's not a great way to to raise blood pressure, and right. um, it can, can be can be uh, detrimental as well. What about people who have high blood sugars? They have diabetes. Is there any relationship between that and uh, a poor blood pressure regulation? Chris Barnes asked this question. That's a great question, you know, and. Uh, we could talk about hours, uh, for hours about that, right? And, you know, there is a lot of research being done about glucagon pathways, insulin pathways, and Parkinson's. And in fact, there are a few clinical trials going on now with uh, glucagon modulating drugs to see if they can slow the progression of the disease in Parkinson's, right? But that's a slightly different topic, right? So what you're asking me is what the relationship between blood sugar uh and and parkinson's uh look i don't know uh, i'm not sure if there is a link between patients with diabetes having a higher risk for parkinson's or vice versa right patients with parkinson's having a higher risk for diabetes and rebecca you may know better i haven't reviewed these recently right yeah i also Um, i also don't know and and i don't know um whether there's any relationship between the blood sugar and the blood pressure either. Um, so I well, think that's it. Or, that's or do you know that? No, that's uh, okay. About that, uh, great question. We haven't, I don't think anyone has measured that, If uh, mm. meaning about direct blood sugar, sugar levels in blood or glucose levels in blood and blood pressure, right? We know, as you mentioned before, we know very well that patients with Parkinson's disease and orthostatic hypotension when they eat, we, I've done these many times in my laboratory, right? We give a patient a high caloric meal, like a, let's say a cinnamon bun, right? Which is like 400 or 500 calories, which is a lot for like a small meal. And 30 minutes later, an hour later, the blood pressure drops dramatically, right? Dramatically. Uh, I will presume that their, blood, their, their sugar in blood is going sky high, and therefore the blood pressure is dropping. So, but again, we, we never measure blood in su- uh, sugar in blood or glucose in blood, right? So that's, a, that's an interesting experiment that needs to be done. But what is, what is a fact is, is what I'm telling you, right? If you eat the higher the calorie uh, intake in your meals, particularly if these are carbohydrates, meaning pasta, pizza, cookies, bread, all the good things in life, ice cream, right? that that's going to lower your blood pressure, right? And that happens even in, in healthy people. That will happen in, in any person with, with no Parkinson's, right? Our blood pressure is going to drop a little bit after meals, after copious meals. That's why in Spain after lunch, they have a siesta, right? It's because the blood pressure is dropping. And obviously this is much more intense in patients with an underlying blood pressure problem, right? So yeah. Absolutely. But I, I will do that experiment of measuring blood sugar in, in Great. my patients. And then we'll have you back. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so now is a question from Len, uh, which I probably should have included in the introduction, a, a really basic question that we definitely have to address, which is what is the correct procedure for taking blood pressure to diagnose orthostatic hypotension? Fantastic. What steps should you take? Perfect. Uh, I'm going to tell you the standard way of doing it, Len, right? So first of all, you need to get a blood pressure, uh, blood pressure machine that works, right? And this sounds like obvious, but a lot of blood pressure machines do not work well, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is you ask the patient to go flat, to lay down, right? And relax for like five minutes. Right, so this is what we call a baseline, supine, relaxed blood pressure. After those five minutes, you measure the blood pressure and the heart rate, right? If you want to measure a second time, just to make sure your the, the reading was accurate, that's fine. You measure it and then you do an average or whatever, right? But the bottom line is you have to make sure the patient is relaxed. 
in a flat position, and then you measure the blood pressure. Then you ask the patient to stand up and you measure the blood pressure after one minute, after two minutes, and after three minutes, right? So you, have, you get three readings when the patient is standing up. I know it's not gonna be exactly one minute because when you press the button of the blood pressure machine, it takes a while to inflate and then it takes a while to get the reading. That's fine, right? That's okay. But that's the way we usually do it, right? So you get the reading at one minute, the reading at two minutes, and the reading at three minutes, approximately. That's it, right? Uh, so you only, you only need eight minutes to get this reading properly, right? Uh, and then obviously there is a drop in blood pressure of at least 20 in systolic or at least 10 in diastolic, you have a diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension, which again can be with symptoms or without symptoms, right? But that's the proper way of doing it. And that's the proper way that we are teaching general practitioners and general neurologists on, on how to do it in, in their office, right? And again, it shouldn't take more than eight, nine, 10 minutes, right? It's not that much. Uh, so I have a follow-up question. Um, so a patient is instructed in yep. these, uh, you know, careful readings and can't really capture it at home. And they come to, to you. Um, do you have any more specialized testing to bring it out? Um, or if you can't capture it at home, that's kind of what we got. Or are there other tests to do? That's right. So we have specialized testing equipment that can measure blood pressure. So we we have, I think we have two or three special pieces of equipment that help us. One is a tilt table, right? Which as you know, as some of you may know, it's just a table that can be moved easily, right? So we can place the patient in any position we want, completely flat or uh, 10 degrees up or 20 degrees up or 45 degrees up or, or whatever, right? Or completely up. And that helps us with the position, right? Because some patients may have difficulties standing on their own. So this table does all the work. We have specialized blood pressure cuffs that measure the blood pressure constantly, right? Every, they take a reading and once they are done, they start taking another one, right? So it's a nonstop blood pressure cuff. And then we have even fancier blood pressure machines that measure beat to beat blood pressure, right? So they can tell us your blood pressure every at every heartbeat, what's the blood pressure at that heartbeat, right? So we get a continuous graph, right? Which is very useful when blood pressure drops very fast because in some patients, the blood pressure may drop as soon as 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds after they stand up so that you kind of capture that with the regular blood pressure cuff that I mentioned at the beginning, right? So with this equipment, we can we can capture that, right? So yes, at specialized clinics, uh, autonomic clinics, we have fancy equipment that helps us with our diagnosis. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, okay. Paul French asks a, a great question. We mentioned that fatigue can be a consequence yep. of orthostatic hypotension. Are there particular traits of fatigue associated with low blood pressure? Can it be distinguished from other kinds of fatigue as fatigue can be its own problem in Parkinson's? Great question, Paul. Uh, yes. I mean, fatigue is, is reported by a lot of patients with Parkinson's and as you, as you guess, right? Sometimes there is a component of low blood pressure. Sometimes there isn't some clues that I will think about. Uh, well, first of all, is the fatigue appearing only when you stand up, right? That means that maybe it's because your blood pressure is dropping and, and therefore the fatigue, right? There are other signs of low blood pressure when standing up that can be associated with this type of fatigue, right? So sometimes patients get a feeling of, I wouldn't say pain, it's more like a discomfort in their neck and in their shoulders. And this is what we call a coat hanger discomfort or coat hanger pain when they stand up, right? And this is because the blood is not reaching those muscles properly. It's because of low blood pressure, right? So if patients have these symptoms, uh, this discomfort in their shoulders, in their neck, oh, I'm so fatigued that my neck and my shoulder, well, that might be low blood pressure. Sometimes shortness of breath too. When, they, when patients stand up and they get a little short of breath, 
It may be because the blood is not reaching the, the, the superior areas of the lungs properly, right? And that may cause some shortness of breath, right? So, but again, the key point is, are all these symptoms happening only or mostly when I stand up, right? So that means that, hey, maybe there is a low blood pressure problem here. Okay, fantastic. So that is very, very helpful. Um, similarly, uh, Reverie asks breathlessness. Um, so it sometimes gets breathless, not been related to pulse or oxygen levels. Right. Um, could that be uh, a sign of hypotension? Yeah, yeah, I just mentioned that, right? So Reverie, very good question, right? Not very frequent, but some patients do describe that feeling of breathlessness. And it could be because of what I mentioned, right? So when we, when patients stand up, not enough blood is getting into the superior area of the lungs. Remember that the lungs are very, very big, right? You get a little piece of the lungs here and here, right? So if not enough blood is getting there, you may get some breathlessness. And your oxygen level in blood with a pulse ox may be normal, right? Because most of the, of the oxygenation is, is done without issues, but there might be some, some component of that. So yeah, it can be. It's uncommon though that breathlessness is the only symptom, right? You get breathlessness and a little bit of dizziness, a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of lightheadedness, feeling about to faint, the neck and shoulder discomfort, right? So if it's in combination with all the others, it could be low blood pressure, right? If it's only breathlessness, that's very rare. Right, but again, something to rule out very easily with with a blood pressure reading in eight minutes that I described before. Right? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, so we have a, it's already uh, nearing the end of our time, and we have only talked about blood pressure, right. um, which. Um, Jose, you told me what happened because people have a lot of questions. Um, but I wanted to ask a couple questions that have come through on other areas of the autonomic nervous system. So sure. Nancy asked a question about feeling chilled. We mentioned temperature dysregulation. Um, is the problem of feeling chilled, can, is there any uh, diet or uh, supplements or anything that can help with um, that, that kind of annoying sensation of feeling cold all the time? I... I don't think so. I mean, I'm not aware of any specific diet that can can uh, address that feeling. I I don't know if if she might be referring to the fact that some people, after having after eating, may have more intense chills, and again, that could be potentially related to to this postprandial hypotension that we were talking before, right? Uh, so that's something to to bear in mind that if you're feeling those chills right after meals more intensely, maybe they could be sort of linked to low blood pressure, in which case treating the postprandial hypotension may help with the chills, right? Uh, other than that, I am not aware of any specific diet that may help with the chills if these are not related to, to blood pressure problems, right, unfortunately. All right. Thank you. Um, and yeah. Nancy also um, uh, asks a question. I think it's probably Nancy as well. Um, asks, uh, what can help if you have a body part, like an ankle or one specific part of your body that feels very cold, feels very cold to the person, but mm -hmm. when you touch it, it doesn't feel cold. Um, is there any solution? What is that? Was there any anything that can be done for kind of that that type of specificity? That's a very good question, Nancy. I, I don't have a straight answer for you, right? I know that some people with, with Parkinson sometimes have cold feet. Uh, and when you touch them, they are not that cold, but they are slightly cold. And sometimes they get bluish discoloration. And sometimes this could be because there is some pooling of, of blood in their legs because the blood pressure is very... The, the, I'm sorry, the orthostatic hypertension is very intense and there is a lot of dysregulation in terms of blood reach, uh, venous return. But I don't think that's what you're referring to here, Nancy, right? It's uh, so I'm, you know, some other patients may have some localized feel, tingling, feeling weird feelings because maybe there is some component of sensory peripheral neuropathy, but that might not be exactly due to the Parkinson's. But again, I, 
I'm not sure, Nancy. I will have to sit down and work with you and and see where we can what we can figure out. Right? It's not a it's not a common issue, uh, Nancy. To my Rebecca, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, I I think as you know, as, as we mentioned, the blood pressure dysregulation. We, we, we have a lot to offer in terms of lifestyle modifications and medications, but temperature dysregulation is, is one of the harder ones to, to really tackle. And I know it's, it's really annoying, but it's, uh, it's, it's really a difficult symptom. So I, mm -hmm. we both mm -hmm. apologize for, for lack of good answers about temperature dysregulation. Um, but amazingly, we have reached the end of our, of our hour of questions. Uh, we wow. have lots of questions that are not answered, but many questions that have been. And uh, I really very much appreciate um, Dr. Palma for all those answers. I have a lot of new tips in my head now. Um, really, really good, uh, good things to share with, uh, with patients of mine. So I, I very, very much appreciate it for, for myself as well. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank our audience because your questions were great and we had, um, you know, really uh, a, just a tremendous uh, response from our audience. So we really wanted to thank you uh, about that. Um, so if you know someone who missed today's program, if, if you join late, if if you want to watch it again, this recording will be available later today on our YouTube channel. So please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel while there and please watch it again um, as many times as you'd like to get all that great information. And for additional information and resources, please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org. I want to alert you to an upcoming um, broadcast, which is going to take place very soon on November 1st. 2023 from 5.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's going to be APDA's Diversity in Parkinson's Disease Research Roundtable. This is going to be a virtual conference highlighting the work of recipients of APDA's Diversity in Parkinson's Disease Research Grant. This grant is a one-year grant that APDA funds to study health inequities and differences among understudy Parkinson's communities across the spectrum of ethnicity, ancestry, geography, socioeconomic conditions, and gender. And our conference will highlight the research results of our grant recipients. So please register today um, and join us. We have a few final messages before I go. I want to thank again everyone for joining us today for your great questions, for your participation. We hope you learned something and we hope to see you again on another APDA program. So have a great afternoon. Thanks. Hi, I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association. Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support.